Great, so welcome to the National VTS Session 6. Uh, so for those that haven't been before, welcome. For those that are coming back, I recognize a lot of names. Nice to see you again. Just a very brief introduction for those that haven't met me. My name is uh, Mohibur Rahman. I'm a portfolio GP uh, with a variety of clinical and non-clinical roles based here in Birmingham and Solihull. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, some AKT questions. We'll do a clinical, an admin and a stats topic. We're going to do some specific consultation skills and how you might apply it to different cases. And then today in GP careers, we're going to start looking at how to compare different job offers and how to analyze the income and understand the income between different offers. Okay, and then there'll be a QA and a at the end. Okay, so let's start with AKT. We're going to do three high yield questions. You get about 57 seconds and then I'll launch the poll. Here we go. First question, clinical. Okay, so very interesting range of answers. So you can see that every answer has been picked, just highlights an area that people often find difficult. The two that are really popular are B and C. So four to five months or 12 months, these were the two most popular ones. Just over a third picked B, uh, just under 30% picked C. But then, you know, quite a lot of people still picked, uh, for example, D, referred to pediatric surgeon, uh, that was nearly 20%. So every single answer has been picked and there's a, a big spread, okay? So the correct answer is B, re-examine four to five months. So well then about a third of you got that right, but that means that nearly two thirds got it wrong. It's an area that we know people struggle with from past exams. So let's look at why, and I'll come back to the question and just show you some specific keywords to watch out for. So in terms of undescended testes, the first screening happens uh, normally in hospital by the pediatricians. So normally within the first 72 hours of birth, you know, someone will check this. And then as GPs, we would normally check this at the six to eight week baby check. And this is normally around the same time that we'll also be you know, checking the mother to look out for things like postnatal depression, if they've had a C-section, you know, are they healing well, things like that. If at that point, when we do the check, the six to eight week baby check, if we saw a bilateral undescended testes, that would warrant an urgent referral to pediatrics, i.e. within two weeks. Why is that? Let me know in the chat. I'll just enable that again. Uh, what would we be worried about that would make us want to do a two week referral to pediatrics if someone had bilateral undescended testes at six to eight weeks? Um, and then <clears throat> if it's on one side only, as it was in this question, would we examine it at four to five months? If it's still undescended, then we'd refer for surgical assessment, i.e. pediatric surgeons, so that they can have the operation usually around 12 months. So it'll allow time for the waiting list and for them to be checked and you know assessed and see if they need all of those things, okay? So yeah, a few people have put some answers. So the reason that you want to, if it's bilateral at six to eight weeks, refer within two weeks, is really to rule out any disorders of sex development or endocrine abnormalities. So things like um, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, for example, would want to watch out for, things like that. Because that would usually be bilateral. So if we have a look back at the key questions or the key, sort of uh, words, the fact that it's at six weeks. See, if we were seeing this child for a follow up and it was already four to five months, then at this stage, the answer would be to refer to pediatric surgeons. But at the six week check, can you see the left one is undescended, but the right one's palpable in the scrotum. So they've only got one side. So that's why it's re-examined at four to five months. So if I just go through the options, so quite a few people picked re in one to two weeks. It's too early. At this point, as it's not gonna change the management, we're not gonna add anything by seeing them again in one to two weeks, do you see? The reason you wanna leave it at four to five months, the majority of unilateral undescended testes at six to eight weeks, they actually spontaneously will descend by four to five months, in which case we don't need to do anything further if we examine them and they're you know, both descended at this stage. 
if we wait till 12 months, this is too late. Why? Because they should be having the operation about 12 months. That's what the British Association of Pediatric Surgeons recommends, is that if they need an operation for this, 12 months is like the optimum time to do it. So if we wait to examine them at 12 months, then refer them, you can see by the time they get the operation, it might be 18 months. So that's why it's too late. This option, which a lot of people picked, refer to pediatric surgeon, that would be if it was still undescended at four to five months so that they can get the operation at 12 months. And then refer to pediatrician, this would be if it was bilateral so that we could look at those things like congenital adrenal hyperplasia. OK, so important to you know pick up some of these keywords. OK, so let's do a little bit more on this before we move on to admin and stats. Why is it that we want to, if it's still undescended at this stage, why is it that we want to, them to have an operation? What are the complications of having persistent undescended testes? Like, what if we don't do anything? What will be the risks? Let me know in the chat. So, yeah, somebody's uh, already said one of the things is that it may lead to infertility. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what else? Increased risk of testicular cancer. They're the two biggest risks, absolutely. Okay, infertility um, and, uh, you know, increased risk of testicular cancer. There are a few other things that th there are slight risks of. So, um, for example, slightly increased risk of things like torsion. Um, you can also have um, increased risks of hernia in the groin later on. Okay, so, but the, the big ones, increased risk of testicular cancer and infertility. Okay, great. Right, let's look at admin, all right? Have a look at this question. Great. So now this is a multiple best answer. You can see it asks for two. All right. So you must get them both right to get the one mark. If you get one right and one wrong, you won't get half a mark in the exam. You'll get no marks. All right. So, uh, you know, the way they mark these in the AKT is very, very strict. Um, so which two of these would you need to discuss or report to the coroner or procurator fiscal? You'll see this phrase used in the exam. Why? Because it's a national exam. In Scotland, they don't have coroners. The equivalent of the coroner role in England, Wales, in Scotland is the procurator fiscal and they have some of the roles of the coroner they actually have some of the powers that the police would have in, in England and Wales uh, before completing a death certificate so you need to get them both right to get the correct answer so the correct answers are D and E now very few of you got both of those okay quite a lot of you did pick E but a lot of people rather than D as their second one they pick one of the other options and so uh, you know, very few people would have got them both and got one mark. Remember, if you get one right, one wrong, you don't get half a mark, you get nothing, unfortunately. OK, now I just want to highlight one particular one and then I'll look at the rules with you. But this, these guidelines changed earlier this year, so it's important that we're up to date with it. Um, so quite a few people picked coronavirus. Someone who tested positive for coronavirus, it needs to be reported to public health because it is a notifiable disease but it does not need to be reported to the coroner or procurator fiscal if it happened at home or in hospital. If it happened in a care home in Scotland, it would need to be reported, but not in England. So they wouldn't test that because of the four nation rule. They won't ask a question where the answer will be different in Scotland compared to England, Wales or Northern Ireland. But in all four nations, someone that died in hospital after testing positive for coronavirus, that's not in and of itself a reason to report to the coroner or the procurator fiscal. You see, so reading the question again, someone might just see reported and thought, oh, that's a notifiable disease. So I've got to um, pick that. They're not asking about it needs reporting to anyone. It's specifically reported to the coroner or procurator fiscal before you could do a death certificate. And in some cases with some of these, like with these two, for example, it might be that the coroner would want to do a postmortem, in which case they would do the death certificate and you wouldn't do it at all. In some cases, you know, in 
not these particular cases, they probably would want to do a, a postmortem in both of these. But in some cases, you know, the, the coroner or procurator fiscal would have additional information because the patient might have been seen after the, the GP had last seen them in A&E or in the hospital for something else. And they might say, look, with that information, I'm happy for you to complete it. Put this in the death certificate for part one, put this for contributing factors, put this for the second part. But that would be on the authority having you, you know, discussed it and reported it to them. In a lot of cases, they will do a postmortem. Okay, so let's go through the rules and we'll come back to this. So these are the new guidelines of deaths that need to be reported or discussed with the coroner or procurator fiscal. So if no doctor that provided care at any point in the last illness is available, then it needs to be discussed or, or reported. If the death is considered suspicious, now what's considered suspicious changed in the new guidelines. In the old guidelines, it was just these four accident, suicide, violence, and neglect, including self-neglect. In the new guidelines, these four were added, medication, poisoning, toxins, and radiation. Okay, so these four are new. If it's related to industrial disease or employment, if we don't know the cause of death, remember the principal thing that the death certificate is there for is to give cause of death, okay? If the death is related to medical or surgical treatment, there's no time limit on this. In the old guidelines, it was perioperative deaths or deaths within 24 hours of admission. In the new guidelines, if it could be related to an operation someone had a long time ago, if it could be related to medicine that they were given, you know, or treatment that they were given a long time ago, it still needs to be discussed. And then deaths that are in police or prison custody. So if we go back, you can see someone who died in hospital two weeks after a stroke, we know the cause of death. There's nothing to suggest that it's any of those that needs to be discussed here. Okay, someone that died testing positive for coronavirus. This is a notifiable disease. We need to notify public health. But just because someone dies of coronavirus, if it doesn't fulfill any of the other criteria, there's no indication to refer report to the coroner or procurator fiscal. If someone dies of advanced motor neurone disease, again, you know, if we know the cause of death and it's just progression of disease, there's no indication that's not related to medication, that's not related to um, you know, neglect or anything like that. These two both. So someone that died after a massive hemorrhage who's taking a Pixaban can see it could be related to the medication because we know that's one of the risks of taking an anticoagulant is that you can have it's the big risk that we tell people to worry about. OK, to let us know if, you know, they notice any minor bleeds like their gums bleeding or something like that. But, you know, one of the big risks is having a massive hemorrhage. So here it's because it could be related to that medication. OK, uh, and then here. If they've got known depression and they took an overdose of codeine, this actually fulfills two criteria. One, this could be suicide. Two, it could be related to the medication. So it fulfills both those criteria. And then here, look, someone that dies because of status epilepticus, you know, prolonged seizure, if we know the cause of death and it's not any of those other things, again, you know, whereas if someone died because of a side effect of their medication, that would need to be reported. But if they've died because of their illness, that's not something that needs to be reported. Okay. Okay, last one, you can use calculators for this, all right? So this is stats. Okay, I'll stop it there. Thank you very much. Okay, so very interesting. Um, oh, did I close it? Yes. So again, every single answer has been picked. Okay, um, so let's have a look. The correct answer is E, 119 per 100,000. And so actually about half of you got that right. So well done, that's really good. But again, that means nearly half of you didn't quite get it right. Um, the, the second most popular answer was C, 1.19 per 100,000. So let's look at what we're looking for, mortality rate, and then I'll do a worked example to show you. So mortality rate is also sometimes known as death rate. Okay, so it's simply the number of deaths 
divided by the population, okay, gives you sort of uh, the, the first part of the calculation. And then what you want to do is usually it's given or commonly it's given as deaths per thousand patients per year. So for example, infant mortality is classically always the stats are given as how many um, infants die per thousand patients per year. So we can look at crude death rates, which is all deaths for any cause. Or we can look at specific death rates, either specific segments or specific causes. So for example, you can look at death in men, death in women, death in patients above 65, death in you know, um, infants, um, you know, people under one, death in neonates, first 28 days. Um, we can look at specific illnesses. So you know, death in patients with diabetes, death in patients with um, uh, heart attack, death in patients with COVID-19. For things that are less common, you often see deaths quoted per 100,000. And if you look at the official government data on COVID-19, all of the deaths are quoted per 100,000 of population. So the calculation is the number of deaths divided by the population multiplied by N, where N is however many it's per. So if you want it per thousand, this last part of the calculation would be divided, uh, sorry, multiplied by a thousand. This last bit, if it's per 100,000, you'd multiply by 100,000. So let's go through the calculation. OK, look, so we want to look at the number of deaths divided by the population. So the number of deaths is 79,351. We're going to divide that by the population, 66,650,000. OK, that's uh, from the latest data, which is from 2019. Uh, and then the last step, multiply by N. So look, this number divided by this number gives you 0.00119. If we multiply that by 100,000, because it's per 100,000, you get 119. So why do people get it wrong? Common mistakes. A lot of people, they don't read this bit, which says per 100,000, and they just use their existing knowledge that I know that infant mortality is often given per thousand. And at that last step, instead of multiplying by 100,000, they multiply by a thousand. OK. Um, and so that's why they get, you know, a different number. Usually they'd get this number. All right. Um, and then we've got people that might instead multiply by 100 because they're working out a percentage. But that's not how mortality rates typically given. You could do it if you wanted it per 100. That's what percent means, right? It means per 100. So if you multiply by 100, again, you're going to get this number. If you multiply by 100 in the last step, you'd get 0.119, OK? Um, by 1,000, you'd get 1.119, all right? But if you do it by 100,000, this is the number, all right? So well done. Look, this is from the government website. I pulled this up today. This is the latest data. Do you see, you've got the cumulative number of deaths so far in the four home nations. And then because we've got, you know, like England's got the bulk of the population, when you look at rate per 100,000, this is the actual figures, all right? So that figure I gave you is for the whole of the UK. You can see about 119. So actually the highest uh, mortality rate associated with COVID from the data we've got is in Wales. Why? Because it's 130 per 100,000. The lowest is Northern Ireland, 82 per 100,000. Okay. So really just to tell you about things that we can do to help you with your AKT, we've got lots of free support. So if you're not already a member of the GP training support group or our AKT study group, uh, someone in the team will post links to those. Please join that. We run this thing called the AKT 30 day challenge. The last 30 days before every exam, I post one video with a high yield question and a rapid review um, and discussion of the guidance for 30 days coming to the exam. That started yesterday. Yesterday was 30 days to the January exam. So day one video was on infertility yesterday. Day two was today, which was on ENT, a topic that people often struggle with. You can see that in the group and every day I'll post one up until the exam. Uh, if you missed the previous national VTS or the lockdown learning from lockdown version one in March, April, uh, you can access all of those free on our YouTube channel. There's over 15 hours worth of videos there now. Uh, and then I'm going to be bringing out, I just finished writing with the MPS, a study guide that's going to be coming out soon for the AKT. And then for our courses that are about to happen, I've got our AKT 200 question crammer course uh, is on the 2nd of January. So that's this Saturday. Essentially, what's going to happen is, you know, we did like three questions there. We'll do 200, but you'll do 50 in one block without any answers in one block. Then we'll go through the answers discussion. You'll get a handout. We'll cover the guidelines. Then you'll have a break. Then we'll do another 50 then you'll have lunch and so on. By the end of the day, we will have covered 160 clinical topics, 20 stats topics, 20 admin topics. And 
it's all up to date guidelines. You'll see all of the question formats. You'll then get access to a full 200 question mark with 200 completely different questions to do after uh, the course. So that's happening this Saturday. We're running that with the RCGP Beds and Hearts as a national revision course. Okay. Um, and then on the 12th of January, if you want to cover all of the stats that you need for this exam um, in three and a half hours, that's on the 12th of January, 7 till 10 30. On the Wednesday is the admin domain, everything you need for the admin domain, which is the one people traditionally do worst in. So we'll cover, like we did one question at a time with rapid reviews, uh, 45 plus questions, 60 plus uh, topics. And then the longest one is the Thursday is higher clinical topics. All the clinical topics that examiners mentioned in the last 10 years will be covering. Um, so that's 57 questions, 70 plus clinical topics. And you get course booklets with all of these. And then we have, for those of you sitting later, we've got another full day AKT course. We've got our structured bundles, the AKT Pass Plus 110 hours, Pass Guarantee 220 hours and online revision. And we also have the case cards, which I'm sure you've seen. So I just you know, put up. These have been updated December 2020. So, you know, uh, up to date guidelines, really easy way to learn. Normally they're posted out once a week on, on, on um, Tuesdays. Okay. So let's look at consultation skills. I want to cover a really important consultation skill. What does ABC mean in relation to consultation skills? Anyone know? Type into the chat. <laughs> Not airway breathing circulation. That's what it means in relation to things like ALS and clinical, but in relation to consultation skills, ABC stands for always be communicated. Okay. And this is really, really important because look, patients can't read our minds. And so sometimes we are thinking, oh, I'm worried about this. So I need to ask this, but if you don't communicate what you're thinking and why you're asking that the patient might not understand and it might lead to confusion, lost time, but actually it might also lead to a point where they, they think that you don't know what you're doing. Okay. So, but, you know, if if it's not going to be obvious why you're going from talking about A to B, you need to let them know in some way. You need to signpost that. OK, you know, so they understand why you're asking these questions or why you're asking this at this time or why you want to do that examination or why do you want to recommend this test? If they can understand your thought process, you will see that it will make things go more smoothly. But actually also give them more confidence in you as their doctor. I'll show you by going through a case example and then we'll talk about a few other cases where you might use this skill. OK. So imagine you've got a patient, they present with really severe low back pain. Okay. Now, you know that you need to find out the mechanism of injury. When did it start? How bad is the pain? Does it radiate down either of the legs? You know, um, what does it feel like? Is it achy? Is it like pins and needles? Is it like uh, electric shocks going down their leg? I know that you know all of these things. But one of the things that's really important is for you to be safe, you need to exclude the key red flag. So what are the key red flags for someone with severe low back pain? Just type into the chat what are the sort of key red flags that we need to think about okay so someone said you know neurological deficit incontinence um, bowel and bladder symptoms all right uh, saddle anesthesia absolutely okay these are all really really important red flags yeah night pain especially if it wakes them from sleep um, foot drop double incontinence urinary retention fever in case it could be an infective cause yeah because things the different red flags for different things right absolutely right great um very young patient or very or, or an older patient so you know younger than 30 perhaps a bit younger than that younger than 20 older than 50 first presentation of back pain i'd be worried yeah definitely bilateral sciatica weight loss if it's been a long-term issue this back pain yeah definitely uh Point tenderness, when you examine the spine, specific tenderness at one point might make you think of a fracture, for example. Yeah. Um, thoracic pain. So, you know, if it's slightly higher up rather than lower back where it's typical of musculoskeletal low back pain or non-specific low back pain. Great. So absolutely, you guys are thinking of really, really good red flags. So let's, let's look at them and split them by what we're worrying about and what we're trying to exclude. So the, the red flags for chord equine are probably the ones that we always try to think about first. Okay, so, you know, bilateral sciatica, Severe or progressive neurological deficit in legs is one of the things. And then the classic one, the bowel and bladder. So perianal, perineal or genital sensory loss or deficit. Um, and then the bowel and bladder. So, you know, urinary or um, fecal problems. OK, so urinary retention, uh, fecal incontinence. OK, and then for a spinal fracture, if it's very sudden onset and it gets better when they lie down. OK, that's really worrying. 
if on examination you actually see a structural deformity or point tenderness when you're actually pointing on one vertebral body. So in terms of cancer, so older patients, it's a longer onset. If they get severe pain that does not get better when they lie down, that's worrying for cancer. If the pain disturbs their sleep, so night pains that either disturbs their sleep or you know wakes them up, the pain getting worse by things that will increase pressure. So straining, coughing, sneezing, uh, people mentioned earlier thoracic or localized spinal tenderness. And then if it's a longer history, if they've had weight loss, or if they've got a history of an existing or previous cancer, this could be the first way we find out they've got recurrence with metastases. So think about the cancers that very commonly lead to bone mets. What are the cancers that very commonly lead to bone mets or more commonly than others? Type that in the chat. Great, so bladder is one of them, yeah. Prostate. Breast often does, yeah, absolutely. Great, so they're, they're probably the, the three really big ones, okay. Um, and then someone else mentioned um, in, infective causes. So, you know, if they've got a fever, if they've got um, uh, immunosuppression, either because of medication or because of existing illness, then we might be thinking about things like osteomyelitis or an infective problem, okay? And they've got a high fever, All right? So let's look, go back to, I was talking about that skill of always be communicating. You understand, and I understand as doctors, why in a patient with back pain, we want to ask about bowel and bladder symptoms. But you see, from the perspective of a, a patient who's got, I don't know, achy pain in the back and they've been lifting and, they, you know, they've had problems in their back before and they come in, you still want to exclude cord equina. But can you see for that patient, they understand why you ask about if the pain goes anywhere because they've got pain. They understand if you ask, is the pain worse if you cough or sneeze or, uh, you know, does the pain wake you at night because it's related to the pain, which is what they presented with. But you see, for that patient, they might not understand why you ask about bowel and bladder if you don't give any signposting. So let me show you the difference. Imagine now I'm a patient and the doctor has been asking about the pain. And they asked me, when did it start? Actually, I was lifting uh, this really, really heavy um, chest of drawers because we're moving house recently. And, uh, you know, it was achy ever since then. Okay. And then you ask all about, does it go anywhere else and all of these things. And suddenly you say, have you had any problems with your bowel or your bladder? And you see, how might I respond as a patient? Doctor, what are you asking me about that for? I'm, I'm not here about that. I'm, I'm here about this pain in my back. It's nothing to do with weeing or going to the toilet. What are you asking that for? See, the patient's thinking, is this doctor listening to me? Why are they asking that? And you're going to end up having to explain it again, but losing time. Also, they might think this doctor's not only not paying attention, they don't know what they're doing. Whereas compare that to someone that, always be communicating, communicating what you're thinking about. I know that you've had problems in, with your back. Remember this patient's had back problems in the past. I know you've had problems in, in, with your back in the past and you said that you were lifting these heavy things when you're moving and you're worried that you know, you've just got a flare up of what you had before. However, there's some rarer but more serious causes of back pain that can cause problems in other parts of the body. And it's important we rule those out. So I'd like to ask you a few questions to do that. Now the patients think, okay, I understand now that they take my pain seriously and they're a really good doctor. They're ruling out serious things. Now you say, sometimes some of these serious causes can actually affect your ability to pass water. And sometimes it can affect your control of your bowel. Have you noticed any changes there? Have you noticed any changes like numbness or weakness? Now they think, okay, I can see why they're asking that. They're trying to rule out something serious. They're a really good doctor. They know what they're doing and they're taking my pain seriously and they're making sure that I'm safe because they're ruling out these things that I don't want to have. Do you see the difference? This is going to take you less time, but it also gives a lot more confidence to the patient. Whereas if you don't communicate what you're worried about and what's going through your mind, they can't read your mind. Do you see how you might end up losing some time having to go back and explain it anyway, but already lost confidence in you. Okay. I'll give you some other examples. Imagine that you're worried someone's got an eating disorder and they're explaining their diet and you know you're worried that it sounds like they're really not eating very much and also it sounds like they're really eating very specific food groups they're trying to avoid all carbs they're trying to avoid anything with fat in it you know very minimal proteins now, when they describe their diet if you don't raise any concerns 
And then often someone with an eating disorder, they might have a different perception of themselves compared to other people. So they're talking about how they feel overweight and they feel awful. And you see someone who really seems very slim and you don't say anything about what you're thinking. And then right at the end, you say, I think you might have an eating disorder. I'd like to refer you to the psych team. Do you agree? And in your mind, you think, oh, me just tacking on this, do you agree at the end? I'm being really person-centered. The patient, what they've heard is, you think I'm crazy. You've not raised any concerns all along. Compare that to someone who, when they describe their diet, they said, look, you know, some of the things that you're eating, it's really good. You know, you're eating lots of salad, you're drinking lots of water. These are really, really healthy things. But you know, your body needs a balance of different things. And I'm quite concerned that from what you've described, you've got very little calories in your diet. That might explain why you're tired, that you've got no fat at all. We need some fat in our diet. Otherwise, we can't actually absorb really important vitamins. Vitamin A, D, E, and K are fat soluble. If you don't have any fat in your diet, you become deficient in these, okay? Uh, you know, your body needs um, some protein for energy. And so I'm quite concerned. And when they describe themselves and you say, look, I, I can see that from what you're saying, when you look in the mirror, you're seeing someone that you feel is overweight. I have to think that's not what I see when I've just checked your weight and your height and when I look at you. And you know, sometimes there are some illnesses where people see themselves in a different way to other people. And you've raised some concerns about these things. And then you say, well, how do you feel about if I refer you to a specialist team that deals with weight and how people see their own appearance and their weight and, uh, you know, can help us look into this in more detail so they understand where you're coming from? Do you see the difference? OK. Similarly, if you've got someone come to talk to you and, you know, um, they're, they're a bit embarrassed, it's something to do with sexual health. Let's say you've got someone who's uh, got erectile dysfunction. If you don't communicate why you're asking certain questions like a really important question to ask is whether they can get an erection in some settings but not others so like for example if they can get it on their own but not when they're with their partner it's one of the ways it's going to help you separate is it likely to be psychological or organic if you suddenly just ask that they're going to think what we ask them that's really personal whereas if you say look to help me work out what might be causing this issue that you've been having you need to ask some questions that will help us work out if it could be a physical problem or if it could be more to do with, you know, some of the stresses you've been describing or, you know, some psychological issues. And then you ask some of these things and, you know, I'm going to ask you some very personal questions, but these questions will help us work out what's causing it. If we can work out what's causing it, we've got a much better chance of helping you to treat it. And then you ask some of these questions. Do you see, they're going to understand where you're coming from. So again, always be communicating. Similarly, suicidal thoughts. If randomly you just ask someone, have you had thoughts of killing yourself or harming yourself? just a bit blunt like that, without warning, it can actually, you're doing it because you want to be safe, but it can come across very insensitive. Whereas again, if you communicate, you know, from some of the things you've described to me, it sounds like your mood is really low and it's really having a big impact on you at work and at home and your overall well-being. Now, sometimes when people feel this way, they can, you know, respond to it in different ways. So I'm going to ask you a really important question. It might sound quite strange when you hear it, but it's an important question we ask anyone who's been feeling down or having some of the issues that you've been having to make sure that, you know, we're being safe and we're doing everything we can to support them. So sometimes when people feel the way you've described, you know, they can have thoughts that life's not worth living or they might have thoughts of hurting themselves in some way. Has anything like that ever crossed your mind? Can you see again, you've communicated what you're thinking before you ask a question like this. You've signposted. So imagine a patient presents with I don't, acne and weight gain and their main concern is the acne but you take some history and maybe their periods are also irregular and you think you know what this could be pcos and you suddenly say i'd like to feel your tummy and they say well i came here with spots on my face and you want to feel my tummy See, they might not understand what you're talking about or where you're going with that but if you said i can see that this acne is really been bothering you and you said that you've also struggled with your weight the last couple of years now, you know, when we were talking about your periods, you said they've been really irregular. Now, there are sometimes some illnesses that can tie all of these things together, that can actually make changes to the skin, like acne, actually also sometimes some hair growth. I don't know if you notice anything like that. It can, you know, um, make it difficult for someone to lose weight. And also it can affect their periods. And this actually can be to do with the hormones that are being released. And all of that actually can sometimes be to do with the ovaries. So would it be OK if I feel your tummy just to see if I can feel anything, you know, um, to see if, if, for example, there's any, any any pain when I press or anything feels bigger, if there's any lumps and bumps that I, I might be able to feel. And they might understand where you're coming from. 
or you know if the patient's worried about x but clinically you think it's why you know i know patient with um a pain that they feel in the chest and they're worried about heart attack but because the pain is more burning you are thinking actually i'm more worried about dyspepsia so i'd like to feel their tummy again if they're worried about heart and you say i'd like to feel your tummy rather than saying look i can see you're worried about your heart i definitely have a good listen to your chest but because your pain is burning rather than heavy i'd also like to feel your tummy because sometimes you can feel a pain up here but it's actually traveling up from the tummy especially if it's burning and if it's related to food would that be okay you can see it shows the patient that you've listened to them but you've communicated what's going through your mind do you see how it's going to help them understand where you're coming from but also give them a lot of confidence in you as their doctor was if you just suddenly said to someone who's worried about their heart and they've told you that and they've got pain that they feel in their chest and you suddenly say i want to feel your tummy and don't mention the chest they're going to feel like were you listening to me or you don't take my concerns seriously do you see the difference okay so you know really i just want to remind you about that that patients can't read our minds so just always be communicating you know if you think okay this is why I'd like to do this. And it might not be obvious. If it's going to be obvious to the patient, that's fine. But in a lot of cases, it won't be. Communicate what's going through your mind. It will actually make your consultation smoother. And this isn't just for exams. You know, I'm talking about real life skills. I'll be doing this when I'm back in clinic the day after tomorrow. Okay. You know, um, so these are things that you can use with everyday consults, whether in hospital or in GP. Okay. And again, for those of you that are doing your RCA or those of you that are actually about to start your first GP rotation as your next rotation or recently started, and you just want to get familiar with how things present in GP, uh, you might find our CSA 100 case crammer videos useful. So it's 100 cases that I discuss for each one, the data gathering, the examinations, the red flags, the, uh, in fact, some of those slides I showed you earlier, they're, they're from that, okay? And it comes with a 350 page PDF booklet, okay? Um, and then for those that are doing the RCA, we've got our RCA masterclass webinars and our RCA intensive course. We're a small group, just nine doctors. Next one uh, that's available is 9th February. Uh, all our courses in 2020 were full. Our January courses are both full. The 1st February course is full. We've got a few spaces for the 9th of February for people sitting later. So we just take nine doctors. And then there's a male simulator, a female simulator, myself and another examiner, either Anna or Masuda from the team. And you know what that means is you get lots of individual practice, lots of individual feedback about exactly what do you need to do to improve. So that and before you come, you get access to the RCA masterclass uh, videos and other videos. So you already can start doing your recordings before you come to the course. And the course will help you polish the quality of your consultations. Okay. Um, right. Last section today, I want to talk about GP careers and how to compare offers. So I'm going to look at things that you need to consider for any role, how to compare different salaried job offers, how to compare a salaried offer compared to a partnership offer. Okay. So things to think about when you're offered any job after you finish training. In training, you know, um, if things are fixed, aren't they? Like the pay scales are fixed, your hours are, are fairly fixed, you can't really negotiate that. I'm talking about after you finish your training, once you're qualified GP. So the first thing I think about is a team. What's the structure like? How supportive are they? What's the interaction like? A really important question that I would ask if I was considering joining any team is, do you meet every day with the team for coffee or tea or whatever? You know, the team that has uh, breaks together or eats together, they, they tend to get on well together. There are some places that will say, no, we don't do that. We're too busy. So the first thing you want to ask yourself is, if people are so busy they can't stop once in a day to have tea with their team, do you want to work somewhere that busy? That's one thing to think about. The other thing to think about is that often places that can't make time for this, it, it tells you that there might be other things going on, that they don't give importance to this. Because what I've seen is, you know, over 19 plus, this is my 20th year of clinical practice, I've worked in so many different teams over the years in hospitals and GPs, is that where I've worked in places where people don't meet regularly, problems build up, you know, problems that are small problems. Like if you had a chat, you saw people, you could just sort it out before it became a big issue. If people only meet once every week at the sort of practice meeting where you're so busy, you've got a big agenda, lots of other things to discuss, and they never meet just for tea, coffee, where you can have a chat or socially. Often things build up until they sort of get to a point where they, you know, serious problems occur. Whereas teams that meet regularly, often, you know, they, they work these small things out. It's, it's just a nice way to 
blow off steam. Think about practical things, distance. You know, you might have a fantastic team, but if it's an hour and a half drive every day there and then every day back, when you're working a full day and, you know, you, you already tired before you get to work and then you're exhausted by the time you come back, what it starts to do is it starts really having a big impact on your overall mental well-being and physical well-being and your time to do things like exercise, to eat healthily, to spend quality time. You could spend time, but if you're so tired that you can't really give any attention to your family or your friends, this has a big impact. You've got to think about these things. The intensity and the workload, do they do extended hours? So, you know, some practices don't do evenings and weekends. Some practices do. Pay and then the specific terms and the contract. Do you see, I've put these lower down. Why? I'm not saying they're not important, but these things are much more important. Okay. And again, once you qualify, there's no fixed pay scales for qualified GPs. It's important that you learn how to negotiate. So in terms of working out how busy it's going to be, this is just a rough rule of thumb that I came up with, right? Uh, based on working in lots of different places. Of course, within any different individual practice, there's different ways of working and it may be more or less busy, but just a rule of thumb, how many patients are there per whole time equivalent GP? So a whole time equivalent GP, uh, Another word for that is a full-time equivalent GP, is a GP that works nine sessions, i.e. they work four and a half days. That's considered full-time once you're qualified, okay? So let's say there's, you know, two full-time GPs and then two part-time GPs, each working half-time. That's the same as having three full-time GPs. So all you do is look at the number of patients registered at that practice, divide it by the number of full-time equivalent doctors, and that gives you a ratio. So if there's one full-time equivalent doctor for every 1,800 patients, that's going to be really manageable. It's still going to be busy because GP, once you're qualified, is really, really busy. Okay, you need to just appreciate that. There's no job in GP that's just really quiet. Okay, it's hard work and you've got to understand that going in. All right, uh, but one in, you know, one full-time equivalent doctor for every 1,800 patients, it's going to be busy but to a level that is still manageable. You'll still be able to meet people for tea coffee. You'll be able to debrief, you'll have time. And especially when you're newly qualified, this is really important that you need time to be able to discuss cases, to talk to people about things, okay? One to 2,000, this is gonna be very, very busy, okay? But again, while it's gonna be very busy, you're probably still gonna be able to have a lunch break. You'll, you'll be able to meet people for coffee. It's just that in between, it's gonna be full on. You're not really gonna have many other breaks you're not going to have time for gaps in between patients. One in 2,200, this is a, a point of busyness that it's going to be really, really difficult for you to get breaks in. You might end up eating lunch at your desk, which is not healthy. I've put it in yellow because sometimes you'd be so busy that you don't have time to pee. Okay. All right. You might as well catheterize yourself, save some time. All right. Um, one in 2,400, look, I've put this here, that you're just putting yourself at a level where you're setting yourself up for stress, burnout, it's unmanageable, it's unsafe. And especially at the start of your career, I really wouldn't recommend working anywhere where you're going to have that many patients per full-time equivalent doctor. Okay. Now within that, you know, you could have two practices where they've got the same number of patients, same number of doctors, but different ways of working. Some have also got pharmacists that can help with a lot of the medication reviews. Some have got uh, nurse practitioners that can see some of the coughs and colds and acute things. Some have got, you know, um, more than one practice nurse that can do, you know, one of them's doing a diabetic clinic, one of them does a, a COPD and asthma clinic. So that's going to reduce the workload compared to a practice where there's same number of patients, but they haven't got those other members of the team. This is why these are other things to discuss. I'm just giving you a rule of thumb. Okay. Now, how to compare salaried offers? It's really important to look at the specifics of the job plan. You know, you could have two people working in, again, in what look like very similar practices but one's much busier in terms of how many patients they have routinely booked in uh, for each clinic. You know, there's practices I've seen where the doctors will be seeing 18 patients in a morning clinic and then another 18 in the afternoon clinic. That's crazy busy. There's other places where people will see 15 in the morning clinic and then there might be 12 in the afternoon clinic. That's still busy, but more manageable. Bear in mind, there'll be some extras. There'll be home visits. There'll be, you know, bloods. There'll be drug charts. There'll be dictation to do for patients you need to refer in. Um, and then it's also important to discuss the specifics, right? Because one of the things that you will see when jobs are advertised for qualified GPs is that they use this term called a session. What that means is different in every actual job. It can mean four hours. It can mean six plus hours. So if you don't nail down the specifics, 
you know, of what they mean and what's expected. What you might do is you might think, oh, I'm going to be working eight, nine hour day, but you end up working there 12 hour days. That's a different level of tiredness. And if you understand that and go into it and negotiate a pay that, you know, recognizing that that's different. Are they going to pay your indemnity? That's a really important factor to consider. Uh, less important than it was a few years ago when indemnity for a qualified GP could be £10,000 plus, but still it can be a couple of thousand pounds. Okay. Are they a GMS practice, a PMS practice or an APMS practice? This is important because it can make a difference to whether or not your entitlement to NHS sick pay or maternity pay or um, things like that are going to be counting all of your past experience or only since you start with them. Um, things like sick pay, annual leave, CPD, all of these things are important to sort of uh, nail down the details of. So let me show you how you might compare two offers and why it's so important to discuss the specifics. Have a look at these two offers. So practice one, which is going to be option A when I launch the poll in a minute, okay, um, is nine sessions, i.e. four and a half days. So you've got a half day. Um, it's a GMS practice. They offer one week study leave, six weeks paid annual leave, and they're offering £85,500 for someone newly qualified. So that's £9,500 per session per year. That's a typical way that people uh, compare or discuss salaries when you're qualified. And practice two, option B, is PMS. One week study leave, six weeks annual leave. They're offering a lot less pay, £76,500 per year, £8,500 per, per session per year. Okay, so let me just... Uh, Just launch the poll. Okay, just if you don't see the poll, feel free to use the chat. Do you pick practice option A or option B. Okay, it's not a trick question. If these are two offers that you've got, you've interviewed for both, they're both like you because you're amazing. Okay, so you've got two offers. You don't have to take the first job you're offered, you know, you can compare different places. So you've got two offers on the table. Which one are you going to go for? So about 70% have picked option A and about 30% have picked option B. See, on the basis of this, I don't know why anyone would pick option B. You have less rights in a PMS practice than you do in a GMS practice. Otherwise, everything else is the same, but this one's just paying nearly £10,000 a year more. Why would you possibly take this? Okay. Well, you might if the details are different, but just based on this, you should take option A. Okay. But let me show you how the details and why you need to discuss this. Option A, if you actually talk to someone who's already working there or discuss the job plan in detail before you start, this is important. After you start, it's too late. Okay. What you find out is actually the doctors regularly work an 11 hour day. They start at eight, they don't actually leave, regardless of what your contract is, they don't actually leave the door until 7 p.m. This is you know every day when they're doing their full days. Their half day, they never get away before 2 p.m. So they're actually working 50 hours, which if you consider that how the BMA model contract defines a session is four hours and 10 minutes. It's actually more like 12 sessions. They're actually working more than full time. Then, then if you work out how much are they getting, you know, divide that 85,500 by 12, they're actually only getting about 7K per session. But it's just think how tired that person's going to be working eight to seven. That's actually at work. Then you've got to add in commute time. Okay. And then if you talk about the details of this, you know, they regularly work a nine hour day. They start at nine, they're out the door by six most days. OK, their half day, they get away by one every time. OK, so they're actually working 40 hours. You know, they're being paid for a lot less. They've been paid for 30 something. OK, um, and that typically happens. Typically, people work a couple of hours unpaid, you know, to finish off all their jobs and, and you know, get everything done. But, you know, that's actually nine and a bit session. So they're actually getting about 8K per session. But again, just think how tired this person is going to be compared to this. So if you look at the details, you might prefer to take this. Some of you might not mind working longer hours because you want the money and you're happy to do the work. Again, if this place is around the corner and your commute time is 10 minutes and this place, the commute is an hour and a half, you've got to factor that in. You might actually prefer this. What I, what I want you to take away is that it's important to do your research, get the details, discuss these things, negotiate them, and don't just look at one thing. It's not just the money, but look at the whole thing. You know, what if this one's You've got a specific mentor. They're very supportive. They have uh, meetings for coffee every day. Although it's a long day, they work hard, but they play hard. They, you know, get together socially. What, what about this one? No one talks to you. You get no support. Do you see? It's not black and white. That's all I want you to understand. And then 
what about salaried versus partner? So remember, a salaried GP is someone who's employed. You have a contract, you have employment rights. A partner owns the business. Like I'm a partner in the practice. There are only two partners in my practice. Myself, the other partner was like my best friend from medical school. We studied for every exam from third intermediate MB all the way up to finals together. And then, you know, we've kept in touch and been friends ever since. OK, um, so a partner owns the business, so they have a lot more responsibility. They can get more reward, but equally a partner could lose money. Whereas as a salary, you're guaranteed a certain amount of income. OK, so that's the difference. So let's say you have two offers. One's a nine session salary and one's a nine session partner. So nine session salary, you'd be contracted for 37 and a half hours. You'd probably work about 40 hours. You, you might work a little bit more. It depends on the job plan. Some, as I showed you in that example, some actually, although they're being paid for nine, they're working 40, 50, 45, 50 hours. Nine session partner has no set contracted hours because as a partner, you have to do the work that needs to be done. OK. Typically, a nine session partner would work 50 to 55 hours a week. Most partners that I know, uh, you know, they'll be there earlier than the rest of the team. They'll often be logging in the evenings or doing some work in the weekends to catch up with the management side of things. There's a lot of admin and workload, you know, human resources, health and safety at work, uh, meetings and things like that, that that you have to do when you run the business than if you're an employee. OK, um, but look at the finances, right? It's really important that you don't just compare directly to a salaried pay. Because as a partner, if you're in the NHS pension, you have to pay your own employer's contribution, which is more than 14 percent. You also, as a partner, will pay your own indemnity, about two, three thousand for full time, could be more if you're doing a lot of private work. Um, as a salaried, in most cases, your indemnity will be paid by the practice. So a partner with one hundred and ten thousand pounds income before pension tax and I is comparable to a salaried GP in terms of income who's on 85 and a half thousand and having their indemnity paid. I both of these people after tax, pension, national insurance, what would actually hit their bank is about four thousand three hundred pounds per month after all deductions. I can see if you just looked at this and thought, oh, you know what, that's more money than this and didn't realize the additional workload and you took it just for the money. Do you see why you're going to be really upset when you're working exactly the same hours as your friend getting the sorry, working a lot more hours than your friend, but getting the same money? who took the salary job was if you took that understanding, I understand that it's going to be more work, but I like the idea of being able to control and being involved in the decisions of what services the practice will offer of, you know, being in charge of uh, being able to develop new services and that potentially a few years down the line, if your business is successful, a partner could earn a lot more, 150, 180, 200. OK, um, whereas a salaried in five years time is probably not going to be earning that much more than this. That's different than if you went into it just thinking I'm going to make more money. In a lot of cases, partners for the first few years that their partners will earn less than the salary GPs in their practice. OK, and a partner is typically going to work 25 to 30 percent more hours. So when comparing salary to partner, I, 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 I'd encourage you to think about the rule of thirds. Whatever the income for the partner is, reduce it by a third if you want to compare it to how much money you'll actually have in, if it was a salaried at the end of the month and then expect the workload to be a third more because of the management stuff. OK, so for those that are coming towards the end of your training, just to say that look, if this is all new to you, if a lot of these things you think, you know what, I had no idea about this stuff, but I can see it's important. So when I'm qualified, I you know, don't end up in the job that I'm going to be miserable in because I understand some of this practical stuff. Our CCT plus course covers the next 30 years, the fun part of GP. So we cover all the most common job options, locum, salaried partner, but also portfolio careers, you know, if you want to develop a specialist interest, if you want to get involved in medical education, sports medicine, um, you know, uh, travel abroad, uh, if you want to develop a private GP role, but a lot of practical skills. So interview skills, interviews and presentations you might need to make at a partnership interview or salary interview, how to compare job offers in a bit more detail, how to negotiate your contract. That's such an important skill. So we will be running a live date for this. It may be by live stream uh, in the summer. We tend to run it June, July. But we have, um, you know, the recorded version, which is fully up to date, which you can access on our website. So, you know, we cover all of these things, how to get the right job, how to negotiate. We actually do practical exercises, you know, interview skills, how to maximize your income for the same amount of work. Some of the loopholes. Sometimes you'll actually make more money by asking for a pay cut if you're salaried, OK, uh, rather than taking it. Similarly, as a locum, sometimes doing a few extra locums can lose you money. You're better off having a few days off and taking a holiday. OK, 
alternative careers, you want to work abroad, which countries recognize your qualification. All of that's covered at the CCT Plus course. So just before we go, make sure you join the GP Training Support Facebook group, subscribe to our YouTube channel, do join the GP Training Support group. It's the biggest group on Facebook for GP training and GP trainees, over 22,000 doctors now. Thank you very much for joining. I hope it's been helpful. Keep pushing, keep going. Huge thank you to the team, uh, Anna, Masuda, Jabeda, Tuba, uh, everyone for all of your support. Um, thanks very much, everyone, for joining, and I'll see you next month. Thank you so much.